Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the stream. Welcome, Grim. Welcome, Benito and Sagleaf and anyone else that's watching right now. Glad to have you here. <clears throat> back at it with uh, Gunforge development. So basically the focus right now for the next couple months is going to be building a demo so that I can hopefully get it into your hands so you can play the game. So, uh, just as a refresher, Gunforged is a 2D roguelike shooter in the vein of Vampire Survivors and Brotato, where you construct your guns out of parts that all have different capabilities. So, let me go ahead and just run the game here. I'll give you a quick, quick rundown of what this looks like. So I've got my two guns, and you can see that I've got a moss gun, which is the green one, and a shotgun. This is something that you probably all have seen, but yeah, alternate left and mouse, <clears throat> left and right mouse click, sorry, to kill waves of enemies. And then at the end of the wave, I get a choice of passive upgrades. And these passive upgrades are permanent for the run. So you can see here, I've got three choices. I'm going to choose this one, Imaginary Friend, which summons a phantom gun. So I'll select that. And then I get to choose an upgrade for each of my weapons. So you can see that my upgrade here is an oil magazine. And I get to see how the stats of each of my guns changes when I select that oil magazine. So I'm actually going to reforge. I can reroll these up to two additional times. And let's go ahead and reforge again. All right, so we've got the oil receiver. I'm going to choose this one because it adds oil stacks, bullet splits, and poison stacks at the same time. So I'm going to select that. You can see there's my phantom gun right there following me around, and I can go ahead and start the next wave. So that's the gist of the game. Um, there will be boss fights and more difficult enemies, and the idea is that it'll be basically just massacring hordes of enemies like you would do in the games that I mentioned before. So, working on making a demo for this game so I can get some people playtesting it. And that's going to be the focus of this stream, is just doing whatever work is necessary to get the game into that state. But um, you can wishlist Gunforge now. The link is in the description if you're interested in being notified when that's available. All right. So with that out of the way, let me show you what I've done in the past couple weeks of work. So for the my most recent set of work here has been redoing this shop UI. And the shop UI is uh, presented to you when you talk to the shopkeeper, who is a random event that can happen in between waves where you can take some of the gold that you've earned and buy things. So this is kind of the general layout of the shop now. Um, the shopkeeper will always have health that you can buy. So I can click one of these and that gets added to me, that health. Um, but then I can buy weapon parts here. And I've, unfortunately, I don't have enough money for any of these. Oh, I have enough money here. So I can also buy weapon parts, which is the same sort of style as the wave upgrade parts that you can get. So they're just additional opportunities to improve my build and all that good stuff. So yeah, that's the, that's the new shop UI. And there's one more thing that I need to do. Well, there's a bunch more things that I need to do here, but the one thing that I want to do on the stream here is just add a, add a back button here so that uh, you can go back to the game. Escape works. If I press escape, the screen goes away, but I'm going to add a back button as well, just because that's, you know, it's typical to have buttons as well. How much will it cost? Um, it will probably, it'll be somewhere definitely less than $10. Um, it'll be probably, I don't know, I would say anywhere from like four to $8. I'll have to decide. That's, that's kind of the range that I'm thinking, but we'll have to see what the final game looks like. Bought your course. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, the link for the course is in the description below as well. So if any of you are interested in learning how to build a game in Godot 4, 
then <clears throat> that would be a good resource. All right, so let's make a button. So I'm gonna make the button kind of look like a metal ingot like I've been doing. And so there's a couple of things that I need to do for that. For one, I'm going to copy, let's see if I can find this. So I've got the passive ingot. Passive ingot gold, yeah, this is renamed. Or this is named terribly, but I'm just going to copy this here, this .a sprite file, and I'm just going to move this over to here. I'm just going to call this buttons.a sprite. And let's go ahead and open that up. And this is what we've got. A basically copy paste of the metal ingot that we have for the upgrades. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, <clears throat> I'm going to change this canvas size here. So where is that? Change the canvas size, give myself a little bit more room. Let's go big or go home. Okay. So for the for the red button or for the button, it's going to be a red version of this ingot basically. And I think I need to shrink this a little bit. So I'll just shrink this up. I'm losing some of the corner detail, but I'll put it back. This just needs to be more compact because buttons aren't going to be that big. So that's why I'm just kind of shrinking this a little bit. I wonder if I have, hmm. Maybe I have a smaller version of the button or of the, um, of the ingot rather, but this is probably fine. And I'm probably going to, let's see. Yeah, I think I'm going to remove a couple of pixels off the sides here just to make it a little bit thinner. And then, sweet, okay. So that's a little bit more dainty, a little bit thinner of a, sorry, I'm just playing with the, playing with the dimensions here. I'm not a pro pixel artist, so it's usually a struggle. Yeah, okay, that looks fine. I like that. So now we gotta change the color. So it's gonna be a red button. So I'm gonna go, just go ahead and fill in these colors here with something different. Yeah, that looks fine. Yeah, that looks great. And then for the bottom, instead of being red, we'll just make it a couple shades of purple here. So one trick that I learned that is really valuable in uh, pixel art is that when you're doing shading, when you're doing shadows like under here is darker, um, your pixel art will really stand out if instead of just making this color darker by just sliding it towards black, you actually want to hue shift it toward blue as well. So you actually want to drag the hue over and make it darker. And so it actually becomes a different color, but then the shadow looks a lot more vibrant. You know, you get a little bit more um, visual appeal in there. And the same is true of highlights, except you move the hue toward yellow and then move the lightness up. Of course, I'm using a palette right here, but I'm using purpling for my, or purples for my shadow ing here. I'm just basically following that same idea. You're a good pixel artist, man. Well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm, I, I would say that I'm good enough. I, I'm just not a pro. So now I just gotta figure out what these colors are supposed to be. Went on that nice little color tangent and, and now I'm struggling to actually pick the colors. Could make it, uh, let's see. That orange might be okay. And just gotta find a suitable, suitable purple color. Actually, I think that's probably fine. 
Oops. We'll just leave it like that for now. Yeah, we'll probably fix that highlight there a little bit later, but this is good enough for now. And so now I just want to clean some of this up here. There we go. And then add a couple of highlights. Cool. So that's basically our button panel. So I'm just gonna go ahead and bring this into Godot. So firstly, I'm gonna export this, output a file called buttons, that'll be good. Let's go back to Godot here and let's open up the theme. And I believe I already have buttons created, but I'm going to override those because they're not good. Quite ugly indeed. Okay, so here's my button. Okay, so here's our normal texture. I'm going to bring over that buttons texture and put that in right in there. And then we have to edit this region. Got to turn on pixel snap first. Okay, so there's our region and just got to move these to be in the proper sp uh, spots. There we go. Okay, so that's our normal style. So let's actually see what this looks like. So I'm going to go to, I want to place the button under this part here. So this is already VBox container. I'll just go ahead and slap a button right there. Okay. So that doesn't look too bad. Now, there is one problem here, which is that it's stretching rather than tiling on the texture. So let's go back to the theme and let's change this to tile and tile. There we go. That looks a little bit better. So now the text is a problem. Now, what I did is I have this new text which I made which took <laughs> many hours to get in place this is a bitmap font so it's basically a font that's reading from an image file instead of like a font file and it gives uh, I was able to pull off this kind of engraved look so we're going to do the same thing for the button but we're going to use different colors did I find a workaround for the 2D glowing in Godot 4 I did not, no. Yeah, that's been, a, that's been a pain point for me, but I'm hoping that that's available or fixed in 4.1, like you said. So the font, so we go to UI, so we've got this skullboy bitmap padded dot font. I'm going to duplicate this. And we're gonna call this Skullboy Bitmap Padded Red. And then we're gonna duplicate this as well. Call this Padded Red. And then we have to actually edit this. So I'm gonna go over to my editor here. Let's see, I switched to Rider. I'm just giving that a try, but I don't know really what's going on with it so let's see if i can edit so if i go to resources ui skull boy padded red oh, okay cool so i can just add it edit it in here so we'll change this to red and i think that's basically it so i just changed the image that it's referencing and then I can open that in a sprite. So let's go to resources, UI, padded red, here we go. So this is our font atlas here. And let's figure out a good color to use for this. So maybe something, 
Let's see. I don't know if that's going to work, but we're going to try it out. Okay, so let's go to the button then. Actually, can I change the button font like this? I didn't even think about that. Let's see if I can. Button, is there a way to change the font? Here we go, yes. Font file, padded red. Oops. Have to overwrite it first and then bring the padded red over. Cool. All right, so it's still, I think I need to re-import this. So I'm gonna select this red font here. There we go. Okay, yeah, so that's definitely, <laughs> that's not readable, but it's working. So let's figure out, this probably needs to be, well, let's give it a few, few different tries here. Okay, that color is nice. I just don't think that that's gonna work. So maybe if I go lighter here and then use that for the darker color. And then for the highlight, maybe something lighter like that. Just got to play with the colors a little bit. Okay, so the highlight looks good. The shadows are okay. So I just need a different color in the middle here. What happens if I go really light with it? All right, I think that looks pretty decent, actually. This, I guess this purple could be a little bit darker here because it's not contrasty enough. So let's try something like that instead. Hmm. I might reverse these colors. Let's see what that looks like. We're just gonna experiment. So fill that one in, then use, what color was it? This one here. Oh goodness, I forgot what the color was. Let's try that. Nah, I liked this configuration better. This dark color, I think, maybe, maybe still needs to change just a little bit. Oh, maybe not. Oh, that's kind of nice. Let's see what that does. Yeah, it's still not contrasty enough. Okay, I'm just gonna have to stick with this darker one then. So the the bad part about being limited to colors is I just have to find the best the best combination. Okay, there we go. Uh, the specific glowing objects aren't available as before. Oh yeah, I already read that. Um, Godot is super efficient for 2D game development. Yes, indeed. Try dark red. I don't have another darker red that I'm not already using like yeah it would it needs to be contrasted with the red here i think that looks fine let's see what it looks like in game here <laughs> you shift it yeah F I've gotta follow my own device or advice I am pretty rigidly adhering to the 64 color palette, so I just have to make do. Okay, so the hover state obviously needs to change, but I think that looks pretty good. So let's figure out how to update that hover state, which colors we wanna use for that. So we'll just copy this move it over. I'm actually going to, we'll leave it like that for now. Um, so yeah, we're going to take probably this color, make this a little bit lighter. And just bump everything up. Oh, I just changed the colors everywhere. <laughs> That's not good. 
we'll have to do the old shift it this way. Okay. Replace that with that and then replace that with that. All right, let's see what that looks like. So go back to my theme. Do you use Sprite Stack for the weapon? So what I do is, do I have an example? Uh, let me see if I can find an example here. Hmm. <laughs> I gotta find one for the gun here. There we go. So yeah, so here's the gun. So the gun is actually composed of three different parts. So there's the receiver, there's the magazine, and then there's the moss barrel. And what each gun part has is it has a series of position 2Ds that basically tell it where the um, the connecting positions are. So if I go to my MOS receiver here, you can see that there's the magazine connect position right here and the front position, which is where the next piece attaches to. So all of those are aligned as they need to be aligned. Um, and then in the assembled gun, those parts are moved into this parts route, which is a canvas group. And then this has an outline shader applied to it. So it makes it look like the all of the pieces are cohesive because it's outlining them all as a group, uh, but they're actually just individual pieces that are that are stuck together programmatically. So that's how I'm handling that. So w whether that's a sprite stack or not, I don't know, but it is a it is a series of individual sprites. All right, so back to the theme, let's edit the hover state. And I'm going to change this region here. Oops, I have to change the texture first. So let's drag that texture over, edit the region. Oh, did I not? I didn't export it. Okay, is that how I had it? I think that's roughly correct. Yeah. All right, how does that look? Oh, I got to change it to stretch again as well. So where's that? The one thing that's annoying about Godot is there's no easy way to keep the theme open while you're editing it, and that's kind of annoying. Hover state, I'm gonna change this to tile. All right, let's give that a shot. So it looks like the region is slightly wrong. I don't know why, I think maybe this needs to move over one more. There shouldn't be any shifting of the details when I hover over it. Oh, interesting. Let's see if that works. What in the heck? What in the heck? Well, I guess I can just copy the texture margins from the other one. So let's see. So our normal is 6398. Somebody remember that, 6398. So hover, 6398. All right, let's give that a shot now. Hmm, there's still some shifting going on. Why is that happening? I don't know if you can see it on the stream, but it's like the textures are different. Did I do something wrong here? 6398. 
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Three Blood. Or Three Blood. Three Booed. The three O's throws me off. Um, why is that shifting? Oh, here's something interesting. Three, five, twenty-five. Interesting. Okay. That was like fractional. Okay. Very weird. Okay. So now we've got eight, six, eight, eight. Why is that happening? Oh, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Eight, six, eight, eight. So now if I go to the hover state, let's just make sure. Yeah. Okay. So eight, six, eight, eight. Or was I looking at the wrong thing? Jeez, this is not. This is not intuitive. Six three eight eight. Okay, six three eight eight. All right, now we should be good to go. Yes. Okay. No more texture shifting when I hover over that. One thing that I kind of want to try is actually extending this up. Oops. Extend that up, or do I want to do it down? I think I want to do it. Oh, that's annoying. So extend the texture region a little bit, and it might give it a little bit of a bounce kind of look. Oh, well, that doesn't look good at all. All right, never mind then. We will ignore that. The other thing that's kind of annoying is trying to animate the buttons. It's pretty powerful as is, but giving them little uh, little bounces and stuff would be awesome. As a matter of fact, why don't we do that? I need to I need to do the pressed state, but we'll we'll do a we'll do a button animation in just a minute here. But let's create the pressed state. I enjoyed your course, even though I didn't finish it, switch to Unity because of object-oriented programming, C-sharp. Gotcha. Well, you can use C-sharp and Godot. That's actually what I'm doing right now, but I'm glad that you uh, that you enjoyed the course. I'm really happy to hear that. All right, so what should the pressed state look like? Maybe something like that, and then... Okay, and then we'll just give these that color here. Good enough. I always do my button animations by moving the top part of the button to the bottom area. Um moving the top part of the button to the bottom area. Do you mean like inverting it? Hey, Trayson, welcome back. And also welcome to the stream, Dula. Um, learning how themes in Godot worked helped a ton and it was all thanks to your course. I'm really happy to hear that, yeah. Yeah, themes are, they're very powerful, but they're also very convoluted. So happy that, um, that the course helped you understand that. So the pressed texture, buttons, drag on over them buttons. What was this? It was six, 
three, eight, eight, and then edit region. I would love to be able to zoom in on this screen just a little bit more, but that's okay. All right, let's see what that looks like. Okay, and then the final thing that I need to do is change this to tile. Perfect. Okay, so let's go ahead and give this an animation. So I think the way, well, let me, um, I'm gonna commit that first. So let me see if I can remember how to do this in Rider here. I don't want, oh, whatever, that's fine. Okay, so add new button art and theme, commit that, master push. VS Code's Git integration is much better. IMO. All right then. So let's do an animation. I actually created another add-on um, here, which allows me to do um, GUI animations a little bit easier. So I'm gonna show you how that works. Firstly, I'm gonna create a new scene. I don't know why I just searched scene. New scene, we're gonna make the node a type of container. Plain control node. Why would I use a plain control node? I'm just gonna do this. Mm. Wait a minute, let me think about this. Well, maybe I can make this a control node. So make scene root. Okay, so here's my control node. I'm gonna call this animated button. And I'm going to add another child scene. I have this animator control node here. And then I can add my button. So a button becomes three nodes in the tree. The reason I don't make the animated control the root is because I can't add another script to this. So this is an add-on with a script. Um, although, yeah, never mind. I mean, this is this is basically the way that I'm going to have to do it. See, the problem with making... Yeah, I don't like this. I might change this type to... I like to use margin containers as, like, dummy containers with the margin set to zero. They just give you simple container sizing functionality. So, scenes, UI... Um, I guess we'll just put the animated button in there. Let's see. Uh, doula, by that I mean moving the top face of the, of the button to the base area of the button. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I understand what you're saying now. Yeah, you can get away with uh, very simple animations usually. Okay, so here's our animator control and here's the button. Now what this animator control should be doing So the animator control basically is a plain old control node that expands to the size of its children. So it's kind of like a container but the reason that it's a plain old control node is because I can animate this thing now. So basically I can animate the button. The animator control keeps its sizing. So that means that when this is placed within a, um, within a container somewhere, right? Then I can animate it independently without it affecting the container positioning. So basically container nodes will automatically position their children. So I just need a layer in between that and the thing that I'm animating so that my position that I'm animating is not being interfered with. Does that make sense? 
I don't know, you can see, let's see. So if I take this button and I move it over here, this animator control now, uh, denoted by the orange line, it has expanded its rectangle to fit the position and the size of the button. And you can see here that it's got its custom minimum size set. So it sets its custom minimum size, which means that its parent, which is going to be a container, cannot mess with this sizing. And then I'm free at runtime to animate the button however I want inside that container. It's a little bit convoluted, just a little bit, but Godot does not make animating UI nodes easy. So I'm hoping that this kind of helps me out. So far it's been working great, but we'll see. Can I expand script of animator control? I cannot, well, I could remove the script here and extend it, but this is GD script and I'm writing in C sharp. It's just cleaner to do it this way. Okay, so there's the animated button and a couple other things that I wanna do here is change these mouse filters to ignore. They shouldn't be a problem, but just gonna do that anyway. Button. You can see the animator control has expanded. Cool. Let's create a script. Um, this is not going to be good. I think this is gonna to try to open VS code. Scripts UI animated button. There it goes. Okay, we'll close VS Code. All right then. So what do we want to do? We probably want to give it a little bit of an animation on hover. So I'm just gonna set up some basic things that I'm gonna need here current tween and button. We're going to on the ready method. Oops. In the ready method, I'm going to take that button dot mouse entered plus equals on mouse entered. We'll copy that and rename this to exited. Oops, caps lock, no. Entered. Okay, something's going on here. Can't type today. So there's my mouse entered and mouse exited. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to current tween call kill if valid, and then reset the tween. And then same deal here. So I want to play a little bit of a jiggle when they're hovered and then when they're clicked, uh, play another animation. Well, now that I think about it, Uh, when you click the button and it closes the shop UI screen, you're not going to be able to see the animation anyway. So maybe we just do a hover and exit animation for now and then expand it later. Okay. So that means that I actually don't even need separate methods for that. I can just do private void play jiggle. And we could take these put that there and then say current tween dot tween property button rotation degrees. And what do we want to use here? We'll just do zero for now. So there's going to be three different states here. Let's do var start angle is equal to 
I'll reference my math util RNG. Let's do rand f less than 0.5. Is there a way to choose like a either one or negative one? Because I want to do this to randomize the start direction. So we're gonna grab either one or negative one and multiply that by five. And that's our start angle. So I can put the start angle here. Then in here, I can do the negative start angle and then back to zero. Okay, and then an on mouse entered, we can play jiggle and same deal here. All right then. Now there's one problem here, which is that I'm not gonna be able to set the button text when I'm referencing this in another scene. So we're gonna create an export variable. Private string button text. We'll make this a property. Yeah, we're gonna make this a property and then make this a tool script so it can be updated in real time. Get set Is that gonna work? I guess we'll find out. So build the project, go to the animated button. Let's see. Uh, let's see, chat. Matthew W, do you ever use ChatGPT to code things? Not to code things, but I have used it to help me debug um, obscure errors, and it's helped a little bit in that respect. But not for coding yet. I mean, I'm sure it'll be it'll be good enough to do that very soon. How do I stay motivated? I don't stay motivated. Um, I stay disciplined. That's the that's the important thing. So, if you work on your game consistently regardless of how you feel about the game at the moment, uh, that's how you make progress. Because the motivation is gonna come and go. There are times where I want nothing more than to just work on the game for hours on end. And then there are other times where I just like don't want to work at all. And the important thing is that you get through the times that where you don't want to work. Um, because that's, that's the tough thing to do. So you just have to be disciplined, bite the bullet, get little chunks of work done, consistently and continue making progress. That's that's kind of what I think about that anyway. Um, okay, so let's see. What was I doing? Oh yeah, I wanna see if this works. Sweet. So now we've got a tool script that I can change the button text of at the root node here and it changes it on the button itself. So that's great. So now I can include this in my shop UI. So this button right here, get rid of that, instantiate the animated button. Excellent. And Yeah, I think that this needs to be shrink center fill. Oh, this is the problem. So I have that animator control, which is shrinking, but I want it to actually fill. So if this, let's say that this is bigger, like that, I want this animator control to, f oh, it does fill. Oh, wait, wait a minute, am I doing this wrong? I think I just need to change the button. The button. Oh, 
Oh, because its parent is a control, it actually doesn't have... So I think I need to change the... the anchors. Okay, is that gonna work? So I made the button full anchors. Nope. Interesting, interesting, interesting. But it works right there. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Now this animator control is not working. What in the heck? I think what I probably need to do is, hmm. So here's the problem. This root node here is large. So if I just set this to 200 and what I want is I want the button. So the animator control is also stretching and I want the button to also stretch with that. But I can't do that with my little solution here. Dang it, I thought I was being, I thought I was being clever, but it turns out I wasn't. Are you aiming for Enter the Gungeon-like game or something like that? It's the, is the project available to wishlist on Steam? Well, I'm glad you asked, Matthew. So Gunforged is a 2D arena roguelike shooter, kind of in the same vein as Brotato and Vampire Survivors. It was gonna be like Enter the Gungeon at one point, but I decided I'm just gonna make the game one room, there's gonna be hordes of enemies, and your goal is to just create a build that's designed to slaughter as many enemies as possible in as little time as possible. So you can wishlist the game if that sounds fun. The link is in the description below. It's the first link in the description. Go ahead and wishlist that. And also if you're interested in learning how to build a game in the Godot 4 engine, I have a Udemy course, which is also in the description that you all can take. All right, thank you for prompting that ad break, Matthew. <laughs> Hello, Heristo. Risto, if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, I, I would say that, I mean, my goal was originally basically to make an Enter the Gungeon clone, but that's really hard to do correctly. And also, I don't know if I should say this, but I tried to play Enter the Gungeon as just like research and stuff, and I actually don't like that game that much. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I, I mean, I think at the time when it came out, it was more um, impactful because that was kind of during the rise of the kind of roguelike genre, right? But it's kind of like too slow for me. Like there's like three enemies in the room and then you kill them and then you have to run around until you find more enemies. I like the boss fights, so the boss fights were amazing and the gun designs were amazing. So obviously it's a great game. I'm, I'd be lucky if I have even 10% of that success that, of that game, but I personally did not enjoy it that much. And that's kind of what prompted me to make my game different than Enter the Gungeon, because I was like, why am I making a clone of a game that I actually don't even really enjoy playing that much? And also, making dungeon generation is really hard. <laughs> um, great pronunciation, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, there's something about it. I think it's like, it's a little bit more deliberate but, you know, obviously it's very popular, a very good game. Just not for me. Master Car. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad. Uh, I think that's that's the thing a lot of people ask is how do I stay motivated? And I don't think I don't I don't think that's the way to frame the problem. The way to frame the problem is how do I discipline myself to work consistently? That's a much easier problem to tackle because motivation is more emotional, right? Whereas discipline is something tangible that you can actually hold yourself to. Okay, so let's figure out why this isn't working. Ugh, okay, let me think. So again, so this is set to be 200 pixels wide. I have the animator control, which is also stretching to that because of the fill mode, but the button isn't. And I'm not entirely sure if I change it to full rectangle, it does that for some reason. That's very odd. I think it has something to do with how I'm 
setting the sizing of the animator control. It's like there's a two-way dependency here. The animator control sizing is dependent on the child sizing, but then I also want the child to be dependent on the animator control sizing. So I wonder if maybe I just extend this and say, child uses parent sizing or something like that. Actually, now that I think about it, do I even need this animator control? I don't think I need that. I think I can probably just make this a regular old control node without a script. Maybe that's what I'm missing. I think I'm just trying to use the inappropriate tool for this problem. Oh, but of course the problem now is that that this control, see how it doesn't, it doesn't keep the size of the child, it doesn't expand to fit the child size. So that's kind of what I'm missing here is that the problem is that if I put this in a layout with other things, the height is wrong here. And so that's gonna cause a lot of problems. So I actually do think I need to use this animator control, but I wonder if I can change it. I wonder if I can change it so that the child is dependent on the size of the animator control and not the other way around. So let's go ahead and edit this script. Let me think about this. Do I want to make it two-way? Um, let's see. Uh, let's just try it. So let's do export. Uh, I forgot how to do exports already. <laughs> Export var. Um, use independent size. If use independent size, return. Okay, so now if I say use independent size like that, I check that and then I say button, full rectangle. Okay, 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 okay. So basically I'm saying I can check this. Now, wait, that doesn't make any sense now though, does it? Because now it won't stretch to fit the size of the content. Oh, I swear, like the GUI nodes are just, they're not fun to work with. I, I, it wouldn't be a problem if I could animate things inside of containers, but... I wonder if I can, like... What happens if I change this type to just a plain old unimplemented container? Right, so it's the same problem. It doesn't stretch to fit the content. Okay, let me try a different approach. So use independent size here, but instead of that affecting the update method, we are going to use that to update deferred. Let's do this. Funk on child item rect changed node Okay, so we're gonna put that check in here. So when the item rect of a child changes, if we have use independent size, we're going to click, we're gonna say return. Otherwise we can call update deferred. And then in here, we wanna connect this to on child item rect changed. 
All right. Let's see if that works. So I have use independent size selected here. Gee dang it. Hey everyone, it's me. I'm a Udemy course instructor and I don't know what I'm doing. Why is this? Okay, yeah, something weird's going on here. Well, the problem is if I make animator control a container, then I can't animate it. Like, I can animate it with a tween, which is what we did in the course, but if I make this a container type, I can't animate the button with something like an animation player. It won't work, right? So if I do a con, whoops, watch. If I do a container, and then I put the button, let's duplicate the button. Put the button there as a child of the container. And then I say animation player. I want to animate the button properties. So let's create a new animation. And look, I can't, I can't change the transforms here. I can keyframe it, but then when I go here, these are disabled, can't do anything. So the point of the animator control is basically to have that intermediary control where you can animate with an animation player or with a tween without Godot interfering with the positioning. But of course, now the problem is that this doesn't seem to work in certain situations. Now, I guess what I could do is I could transfer the size of this margin container to the button, right? Or I could take the animator control. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. If I just transfer the animator control size to the child, to all the children, perhaps, maybe I'll call this um, match. Uh, let's see. Children match size equals false. So there has to be a different logic in here. And the different logic is that if we do this, we'll say if children match size, else do all this. Okay, we're getting there, we're getting there. So if children match size, child dot size is equal to size. <laughs> That's kind of uh Why does this still say use independent size? Did I do something wrong? Identify or use independent size. Oh. Got to get rid of this. Let's see. On a similar topic of motivation and discipline, how do you avoid getting burnt out uh, of ideas? By the way, hope you're having a good day. I am having a good day. I'm having fun. The stream, it's, I always enjoy streaming. And this weekend has been pretty chill. So I had a lot of time to work. So it's feeling good. But how do I avoid getting burnt out? Um, the thing that helps a lot is just to do different tasks. So if you're working on the UI a lot, like I am right now, and you're getting sick of it, um, just move on to something else for a little bit, you know, like go develop some new gameplay content for a couple hours or work on sound design or, you know, a lot of people don't consider all the tangential things that need to happen too. Like if I don't feel like developing, sometimes I'll go and work on a video instead. And the video is not a direct contribution to the game itself, but it is important for marketing and for building an audience, right? So it's still important work. So I think big thing to avoid burnout. And then also I like to participate in game jams too, like the Ludum Dare is coming up soon. I'll probably do that. Even though that's valuable time I could be spent working on Gunforged, it's really, it's really important that I have a little bit of room to do a little bit 
of experimentation and work on something new, even if it's just for like 72 hours. So I would say, yeah, vary up your tasks and take opportunities to participate in things like game jams to get that itch out of the way to like build something else. Um, of course, there's downsides of doing that too, which is that, you know, you push the deadline. If I spend too much time working on tangential things, then Gunforge will never get done. So it's a balance, but that's, that's, uh, that's my thoughts on that. Okay, so let's go back to our animated button. Children match size. And it did not work. Did it not work because of, let's see, print. Let's just put a print statement in there. Is that still? Okay. Oh, did I not? What is going on here? If children match size, child dot size equals size, print size, and that's not happening. Why isn't that happening? Is Godot like conspiring against me to make things not work? We'll go with that instead of me doing something wrong. We'll just blame blame the program. Oh, there it goes. Yeah. Now there's still something wrong. All right, I'm getting tired of, of dealing with this. I, I almost think that I probably have to implement basically, I might just have to go and copy the code from a margin container and re-implement it myself <laughs> just so I can get all the positioning aspects, but without the forced repositioning of elements. I don't know. So it's obvious that this isn't going to work. So I'm just going to drop this for now. That was a big enough tangent. Um, we're just going to get rid of that. And we're going to deal with the fact that the button is not going to respect the sizing that I want. Because I want to get this button animated and done. Okay. So we'll just have to leave it like this, I suppose. Thwarted by the Godot UI system again. Yeah, I mean, the Godot UI system is like really good. It just, I just need it to be a little bit more flexible for animation in particular, because this is just a major sticking point. But there's always a workaround. That's what my dad always used to say. There's always a workaround when you're building games. That's not a real quote, but Now, okay. Oh, I can, uh, since this is a margin container, I can just go ahead and knock down the margin top a little bit. There we go. So it looks kind of out of place. I would love this to match the width here, but it's not going to, that's fine. I probably want that to be all caps too. So I'm gonna go ahead and enforce that here. Oh wait, I can't do that, can I? Well, never mind, because I can do it in here. Is two, does two upper, does that uppercase every letter? Let's see. Oh, it doesn't like that. There we go. Nice. All right then. And you know what I could do?
Yeah, that's fine for now. All right, let's see if the animation even works. Okay, perfect. So it's working, it just doesn't have the correct pivot offset. So let's just give it the correct pivot offset. So we're going to say button dot pivot offset is equal to button dot size divided by two. What happened to my text? Oh, goodness. <laughs> All right. I don't think it likes the way that I'm doing this. So. We're going to actually store this in a variable here. Well, whatever, we won't do a null chaining. Let's see. So we build it. It really is like tool scripts with C sharp a little bit iffy. Just a little bit though. And I need this to be too upper. Almost done fighting the UI here and then. Okay, there we go. Cool. So that's basically working the way that I want it to. Probably just reduce these a little bit. Reduce those times. I can actually run the uh, scene from here. You work full time on my project? Uh, I don't. I'm a full time software engineer, actually. So I'm just working on this game uh, in my free time. This is a lot of work for what it's worth. Let's try this instead. We'll just call the set of the button text in a deferred fashion. There we go. Okay, there could be a little bit more animation tweakage right there, but let's just get the button working as expected. We're going to do a signal here, public, delegate, void, pressed, event, handler, and then in ready, let's go ahead and do a button.pressed plus equals emit signal, signal name dot pressed. So we're just forwarding that signal basically. And then in my shop UI, oops, where is it? I'll figure out the hotkey eventually. Shop UI. Let's do this. In here, we need that animated label. So node, private, animated, or animated button rather, uh, back button. And then in here, in the ready method, we'll create uh, back button dot pressed. We'll create a, a function called on back pressed. Oops. 
let's just throw that down here. On back pressed. I think I can just call Q free here. Maybe there will be a fancier animation, but. And then in here I need to, I need to rename this to back button. Back button, access as unique name. All right, perfect. That's working. So let's see what it looks like actually in the game. So when we run it in the game, firstly, I need to change the random encounter handler component. Let's make the shop way more, uh, what's it called? What's the word I'm looking for? Way more, I don't know, likely, I guess is the word. <laughs> This is a great game dev channel. Thank you. May I ask what do you, why do you use C Sharp? The reason uh, I use C Sharp is basically uh, just because it's a little bit, I find it a little bit easier to apply typical software design patterns. I like the typing for one, but I also like being able to use interfaces, abstract classes, all that kind of thing. Um, and plus it's, um, you can use all kinds of NuGet packages as well. So it's just, I think it just comes down to, I just prefer using C Sharp more. And yeah, that's that's basically, that's basically the only, the only reason. GD Script, especially the new version of GD Script is very capable. So I will probably be using GD Script when I participate in Ludum Dare just because it's um, it's really quick for prototyping and, and making games generally. Don't have to worry about getting all kinds of things set up, you know? So this got a little bit nudged. So I actually think maybe this back button shouldn't be Maybe I should put the back button right there outside of the flow of that VBox container and then give it a little bit of margin on the bottom there. There we go. Let's kill some more rats. Did I show, I don't know, did I show the rat boss? The new rat boss? I'll show you guys the new rat boss in a couple minutes here. Let's just see what it looks like when you encounter the shopkeeper. All right, so there's the shopkeeper open. Cool, so this is what the shop looks like when you open it up. I don't have enough gold for these things. There probably should be a little bit of padding there. So I don't have enough gold for these things. Luckily, I'm a dev, so I can cheat. So let's add some gold. Okay, and now let's see. So I've got health globe, which I can buy. I can also buy different upgrades here. So let's see if this actually works. So this worm receiver. Okay, let's go ahead and buy that. So I buy that. This item's out of stock, cool. And my weapon has been changed. So you can see now I've got that worm receiver. If I hit I, I can actually see uh, what my stats look like here. So I can see that I've got all my stats like normal. And yeah, let's go ahead and do an upgrade. Ooh, Blood Brothers, let's do it. Summon a Blood Golem when a bleeding enemy dies. I have bleeding, so we'll keep that. And let's just take 10 gold here. Perfect. All right. Next wave, beam them out of there. All right, there's a little Blood Boy right there. So do you see them crawling around and going and blowing things up? <laughs> Little handlebar mustache blood brothers, my favorite passive for sure. So yeah, this is basically how the game is going to play. 
you just upgrade your weapons, synergize with different builds, all that kind of good stuff. Let's do another upgrade here. Blood Torrent. Oh. I think I will take Zap, though. Zap's the nearest enemy with lightning every two seconds. So we'll grab that one. Oh my gosh, look at this. Look at all these affixes. One poison stack, double damage on the first bullet, extra damage when on low ammo, fire rate increases when magazine depletes. Let's just stack this one up. All right. Look how fast that is. All right. I can visit the shop again, but I'll just keep going. Keep going with this uh, playthrough here. Oof. You see the zaps coming down. So there's a fixed number of enemies that can spawn at once, but the incentive is that you want to kill them as fast as possible because they all have a chance to drop gold. So your ability to kill things faster improves your ability to make money, which improves your ability to create the build that you want to create. Oof. I was out of uh, out of dashes, so I had to take that one to the face. All right. Well, let's see what our next upgrade is. Could do a stamina increase. I don't have oil. Let's do a stamina increase. So now I've got two stamina points. We got to start upgrading this other gun, so let's see. Bullet splits when colliding with enemy. Yeah, let's do that one. All right. Let's go in again. Still got a couple more enemies that I want to add to this dungeon. Right now, there's three different types, excluding the boss. So four if you count the boss. Oof, oh, dang. Oh, I don't want to be up against the wall here. Ah! Maybe it's a little bit difficult, but I died. Anyway, so that was a quick little demonstration of what the gameplay actually looks like. I can show you the rat boss now too, but let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, wow. Um, hey, I just wanted to say thanks so much for the tutorial and composition. You're welcome, Tralala. I'm glad that you found that helpful. I would love to do more tutorials like that in the future. So stay tuned, subscribe, and all that good stuff. Game's looking great so far. Thank you, Hassan. I appreciate that. The game looks good. Thank you, uh, Pepe Pepe Mariano. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, got your Godot 4 course. Super cool. Great teacher. Thank you. Uh, I like the way you, you work. Take a look at your course. Awesome. Thank you, Master Car. Let me know how you how you like it if you end up getting it. I have an idea for a gun modifier. Leader of the pack. All summons attack only when you do. Ah, that's cool. Yeah, I'd have to... Um, I'm going to introduce more summons for sure. So summon-oriented passives like that are definitely going to be something that I'm that I'm going to add. What's the right way to learn shader script? Uh, I think you should just probably start with I'm I'm not a shader expert. I can write very basic shaders. Um, start with simple things like how do you change colors or how do you one one really simple thing is, you know, like enemies will flash white when you hit them in a lot of games. So figure out how to write a shader that allows you to turn an enemy all white for a brief amount of time. Start there, start writing basic shaders like that, and you'll understand sort of how, how shaders work when you do that. That's kind of how I've been building up my skill, and I've been able to get into a little bit more advanced stuff. Like I, start, I tried writing a fog shader that turned out pretty decent. Um, I can write basic like screen transition shaders and all that stuff. The other thing is that there's a really good YouTube channel. I forgot what it's called. Something like fun with shaders or something. Um, there's a real, if you search like screen transition shader on YouTube, 
I think you'll find the channel that I'm talking about. That's kind of where shaders really started to click for me is when I watched one of those videos. So yeah, YouTube resources and then practice writing very basic shaders in Godot or there's another website called Shader Toy where you can just write shaders in kind of like a sandbox. So yeah, that's kind of, that's probably where I'd start. They're very daunting, they're very complex. I was very hesitant to get into shaders because of that, but it's not so bad. All right, what errors do I have? Anything relevant? I don't think so. Okay, so let's show you all the Rat King boss if I haven't shown it yet. So the Rat King, so the basically, the way that the game is constituted right now is that every fifth wave will be a boss. And I'm gonna try to create a bunch of different bosses, but the Rat King, I, I had built the Rat King initially, earlier in development, but I've updated him quite a bit. So his visuals are updated. So here's the Rat King. He's got a little pudgy belly. I don't like his eyes. I'm gonna change his eyes, I think, but that's the Rat King and let's go ahead and see what he looks like in game. So there's the intro, the Rat King. And now he's gonna run around. He shoots mouse traps in all directions at you. And then he shoots these little projectiles which look like rats. And of course he spawns the individual rat mobs as well. So I might add another attack to him just so it's not so repetitive, but that's the Rat King. Let's, let's fight him again. The Rat King. Play with Versifer. No, it was, um, I'll see if I can find the video after this. That's a good uh, resource as well, though. Have you started public playtesting yet? Not yet. I'm currently, par um, my current focus is building a demo so that I can start playtesting. How many bosses do I have currently? One. <laughs> um, there will probably, see the thing about where I'm at with the game right now is I'm building the demo, but what I'm building is essentially not new content. I'm just trying to make the game more presentable. I've been adding sound effects off stream, um, trying to make everything feel more polished and trying to make the gameplay feel as good as possible with the content that I have currently. So the demo is probably gonna feel very bare bones, but the purpose of the demo is to get like a, a temperature check in terms of do people like how the game plays? Like if I release the demo and everyone just says, just give us more content, then I'll be in good shape. But if people have fundamental issues with the actual game play, then I'll have to address that as well. But I think the content, I think there's enough content for a demo. I might add a little bit more, but yeah. Making a vertical slice. Yep, exactly. That's exactly what I'm doing. Let me see if I can find this shader thing. So, screen transition shader. Here we go. Making stuff look good shader case study. Okay, so I was way off. So it's this. Oops. So it's this, Shaders Case Study Pokemon Battle Transitions. So it sounds very hyper-specific, but this, this guy actually does a really good job of explaining what's going on in the shader. Like I said, this was like the first, this is the first time that shaders really started to click for me. So yeah, it's by making stuff look good, Shaders Case Study Pokemon Battle Transitions. So take a look at that, I would recommend anyway. And, uh, I think you'll find it very helpful. Okay, so I think the uh, I think the shop is looking pretty good right now. I think I can, I think I can say I'm I'm done with that for now. 
I have to go back and add sound effects, but I'll do that off stream because that's a little bit hard to get all the audio levels correct on the on the stream. And also it's not it's not super riveting to watch me just click through a giant library of sounds. <laughs> uh, okay. So commit message, added animated button, back button to shop UI. All right, so I'm gonna take a short one or two minute break and then I'll be back and we'll continue working on something else. So I'm gonna push this. Cool. All right, so before I go on the break, if you all are interested in the game, um, Sorry. If you're all interested in the game, you can wishlist Gunforged on Steam. So I'll pull it up right here. So here's the Steam page. You can wishlist it on Steam. Um, my goal is to have it released this summer, but uh, time's a ticking and it doesn't look like I'm going to hit that. But wishlist it if you're liking what I'm doing, if the game looks good to you. And also, if you want to learn how to build a game in the Godot engine, I have a Udemy course which I will show you here. It's how to create a 2D survivor style game in the Godot engine. Uh, whoops. Well, the link is in the description. I, I'm logged in right now, so it's not taking me to the landing page, but yeah. So take a look at those things if you're interested. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take a one or two minute break and be right back to continue some development. All right, I'm back. Let's see, Dennis, I just finished your course. It was a great experience. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are, um, all of you who are purchasing the course are making it a lot easier for me 
to spend money on the types of licenses and tools and sound effects libraries and stuff that I need to make the game. So um, that's helping out a lot. So thank you all. I'm glad um, that it's useful. I'm glad that you're getting a lot of value out of it. So, and you're also helping me a lot. So thank you. Um, want to make your coding more riveting? Add the ridiculous coding plugin to Godot. Oh, is that the one where it explodes every time? Like it's a super juiced up editor where every time you type a letter, it'll just explode and shake the screen. That's uh, yeah, I've seen that. That's ridiculous. Does hashtag knots no, I don't know what that says. Not spawn. Did I just get baited into saying something inappropriate? <laughs> I don't know what that means. Okay, so let's figure out what we're going to work on. And I'm going to show you my super, super, super secret um, project management board here. So you can, if you're quick, you can get a glimpse of everything that I have planned. Oh, it means not sponsored. Oh, I see. Cool. So here's my board. Um, so here's all the things I've got done since the last devlog. I've got some sound effects that I need to do. Oh, I added the back button. So let's go ahead and move this on over. Back button is added. Cool. So I need to do these sound effects. Got a bunch of bugs here. One of which is the shopkeeper text is mirrored when interacting. Can I actually fix that? But let's see, what do we got in the backlog here? I might just do some playtesting and fix some issues as they come up as well. But I just wanna see. Enhance bullet tracking with Pierce, show. We can potentially do this one. I want to reduce the speed of the fire rate of all the weapons as well. Redo shop UI. I already did this, so I'm going to drag this over and delete this other one. Enhancements to reward screens. This is also done, so we'll go ahead and add that. Look at that. I love automatically completing things in my backlog. Card hover highlighting broken. This one is irrelevant now, so we'll delete that. I think what I'll do is I don't really have anything in the backlog right here that's super pressing. So what I might do is I want to give this one a shot, which is to make the phantom gun more phantom-esque. But I also want to do some balancing. So let's go ahead and just do a bunch of playtesting. And... Um, First of all, I know that I want to turn down the fire rate of a lot of the guns, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. And also, the fire rate increase of that affix. So, let's do a couple things. So, um, fire rate ammo affix. So in here, this affix, it increases the fire rate by something like... ...200%, I think. So bullets per second times equals one plus... So this is the percent full. Let's rename this to What? Why can't I rename this? There we go. So this will be up to 200% fire rate. I'm going to knock this down to an extra 100% fire rate. So it's not super fast. And then in my resources here, so I have resources, gun, 
So let's just say I want to go to the Moss magazine here. Or the Moss receiver, rather. Bullets per second is nine. Let's bump that down to maybe six. So we'll reduce it by 30%. And then, um, let's see. Oil receiver is four. Shotgun receiver is three. Worm receiver is five. I think that's probably fine. Banana receiver, four. Okay. Let's see how that plays. Just the, I guess I just knocked down the, the two the two things. Did that actually do anything? <laughs> it still seems to be very fast. Moss receiver. Oh, it didn't save. Why didn't it save? Okay, so slow it down a little bit. The reason I'm slowing it down is because it's just, you accelerate really quickly in terms of filling the screen with bullets. And I just want that to be a little bit more gradual. A method for making a phantom gun more phantom-esque could be adding a shader and tying the alpha value to the brightness of a Perlin noise. That is exactly what I was going to do. Yeah, I was going to make it a shade of purple and then have Perlin noise affect the alpha value. So there'd be a base alpha value. Maybe it's like 75% opaque or 25% transparent is another way of saying that. And then have a Perlin noise, you know, flowing over the texture, which modifies the alpha value. So yeah, we're on the same page, definitely. Um, let's see, what do I want? Blood Brothers, I don't have, I want to add a passive that adds a button to this screen that allows you to re-roll the options. Reload both guns on dash, we'll, uh, we'll take that one. All right, what do we got here? Crystal Magazine, Bullet Splits, this adds poison. Let's, uh, let's take that. Alrighty then. I think poison might be a little bit strong as well. So I think balancing is going to be a really hard problem because I don't want to I don't want to rob the player of feeling really OP. Like the point of this game is to make the player feel really really strong and like the build that they're creating is super unique and powerful. Because it's always fun, right? Like whenever you're playing an action RPG, you get that one item that just makes you kill everything on screen with one button. That's really fun. So I'm trying to make the player feel that constantly. Uh, it's just really hard to, to not make things like obviously stronger than other things, right? So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Increase movement speed by 10% for each enemy within 96 units. Um, I don't know if I like this passive anymore because it requires you to be near enemies. Um, I just thought of another, another passive though. Player passive. Um, grants a small burst of movement every time you kill an enemy. So this will be passive, unique, and let's add like a five second cooldown or something. Cool. The other thing that I don't like about video games that I'm really trying to protect against is a lot of times you'll get upgrades that are completely useless against bosses, right? So like, oh, look at this. I'm stunning enemies 50% of the time. Isn't that cool? And then you get to the boss and it's like, here's a stun meter that you have to fill up before it gets stunned for a quarter of a second. So I'm just, I don't want to do that either. <laughs> I, I want everything to be useful in all contexts in the game. Easier said than done, I'm sure, but... So 
Saps the nearest enemy with lightning, increase health by one. Let's do that, because I died last time, and I don't I don't trust my ability to stay alive here. Let's reforge. Um ref oh, let's see. I'll reforge again. Okay, this one applies bleed and poison. Oh, I can have bleed poison and bullet splitting with an increased fire rate and capacity. Let's do it on this one, yeah. Awesome. Let's go. So you can see how wacky these guns are, right? This is a worm receiver, so it's got like a worm body. And then it's got the shotgun barrel and the crystal magazine. I just love how like the guns become these Frankenstein monsters. Ugh. The other thing I have to be careful of is um, the dashes. So I actually think it's really good having one dash that's on a semi-long cooldown. Um, but there are upgrades you can get to increase your amount of dashes, but I think I just need to make sure that the player can't dash to the point where they're invulnerable 100% of the time. So I'll probably keep like dash cooldown reduction passives to a minimum. Maybe even I could add a cooldown penalty, right? Every For every extra point of dash you have. So if you can have three dashes banked up, the cooldown increases by something like 10%. So you have to wait longer between each dash, but you can have more banked up at once. That might be a good way of balancing it. So that way you're not just always have a dash up that you can that you can use. But something that needs to be play tested, I think. All right, I've got some money and the shop appeared. So let's see what's going on here. All right. Um, bleed. I, I feel like this isn't working. I think I need an indicator here. I need to be able to see which affixes are new. I don't really have a good way of seeing that right now. It's showing me my existing affixes. And it's only adding one new one, and that's really hard to parse. So I'm going to go ahead and... I'm going to add that to my to-do list, actually. Um, specifically, let's see. Call out new affixes. Make existing... Call out new affixes when comparing parts. Make existing affixes more muted in comparison. And this is UI. So I'll add that to the backlog so I can do that. So what do I want to do here? This fire rate goes down, but the DPS goes way up and it adds oil and poison. I don't know if I want that. Let's see. See, this is really good right here. This becomes gray and becomes crossed out to indicate that this is not um, being added. Let's see. So this one is a good, this doesn't change the DPS though. Oil receiver. Bullet splits when colliding with enemy. Banana receiver. I think maybe these um, these affixes are a little bit too common as well. What I might do is I may, might make the shop, um, I might make the shop have an increased chance of generating affixes on the weapon parts. But the, nat the weapon parts that are presented as wave upgrades might be a little bit less common. Or I guess I could just, yeah, I could reduce the number of parts that are available here. I think I'm going to go with the shotgun on this part here. And oh, I should show my health on this screen too. show health on the shop screen I guess I'm not done with the shop screen yet I guess I could just show it on well I can put it down here as part of the status right so let's buy a couple of health globes here all right I'm healed up and I have two gold left so I think that's all I can do sweet 
Let's get the phantom gun. I love the phantom gun. We got another upgrade here. This one just increases the bullet speed. Yeah, let's let's reforge. Moss barrel, moss barrel. This is kind of fun. I haven't uh, I haven't played the game as an actual player in a while, so just trying to like put my my mind in the shoes of a player and think. And if you guys have any comments too, like as you see me play this about something that doesn't look right to you or doesn't quite make sense, uh, feel free to let me know. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see, I missed your comment. Let's see. Da -da -da. Maybe maybe make a certain enemy type that's immune to poison, so poison can really be strong on some enemies. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I explained why I don't want to do that. Because the, the other problem is that the player currently doesn't have a whole lot of control over the affixes that they can get. So if they start picking up a bunch of poison things thinking that it's really strong, and then I throw an enemy at them that they didn't know was coming that had poison immunity, that would just feel really bad, right? Because I didn't tell them that a poison immune enemy was coming. I didn't give them any control over their build, or at least not to the extent that they could be really specific about their build. And then I throw an enemy that just like bricks it. So, um, now, an enemy that can use poison damage against you that deals maybe has different attacks based on how much poison damage you do to it. Maybe that's something else like just change the challenge rather than um, just flat reduction of damage. Hey, Master Car, thank you so much. Yeah, feel free. You can use the Q&A or DM me while you're taking the course if you have any questions. So but thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. What engines have I tried? Well, fun banan before nan. Um, I've I originally started game development working with Game Maker, like the really old version of Game Maker, um, Game Maker Eight or something like that. And then I moved to Game Maker Studio Two, and um, I used Unity and Unreal a little bit in college, not not much at all. And then I switched to Godot. So I think that the engines that I've used the most have been Game Maker and Godot, for sure. All right, let's see. Oil stack, poison stack, and bleed stack. Let's do it. Yeah, I feel like these status effects are building up way too fast. I might need to reduce the likelihood that um, affixes are gonna drop. So let's see. So if I go to my gun part randomizer. We'll just ignore that for now. So. I'm just trying to figure out where I'm actually generating the affixes. Pick affixes here. Okay. Loot table, pick item. So non-null affix loot table. Affix loot table. Okay, so it looks like the chance of picking an affix is is really high compared to the chance of picking nothing so i could either turn that chance to pick nothing up or yeah so the interesting thing about this code is that it keeps running so if it picks an affix it'll run again and it might pick another affix it just, it runs until it hits the max number of affixes, which is, you can pick two per part. It runs until then, um, or until it picks a null affix. So what I might want to do, I could increase the chance of picking nothing, or I could make it less likely that it's gonna pick two. 
I think I do want it to be... It should be reasonably likely to pick at least one affix, but it should be less likely to pick um, a second one. So how do I want to handle that? How do I want to handle that? Well, I'll just, um, we'll continue playtesting. I'll keep thinking about that. Um, reduce chance of picking multiple affixes. So we'll just write a little note there so I can come back to it. All right. Looks like we got the shop again. I only have, oh wait, I already bought, okay. Let's go then. Next wave. Look at my phantom gun going. There's a bunch of shader issues still with Gidel 4 that's causing like these artifacts to appear on the screen. I think what I really need for this level is I need something that has like a, a zone area, like a ground area. Because right now I can kind of just move in circles. But if there was another enemy type that could put like a like a circle on the ground that I have to avoid, uh, that would actually add a lot of um, challenge to the movement here. All right. I need some kind of wave counter too, I think. I don't have the wave number anywhere. Add wave number somewhere on screen. Okay. Let's do an upgrade. We got zap, berserk. Oh, let's do quickness. Yeah, increase movement speed for sure. I'm feeling kind of good about my build. Maybe I'll reforge a couple times and then see... Oh my goodness, look at that. Bullets track to the nearest enemy to the crosshair. Speed goes down and spread goes down. Let's do it. All right. Here's the boss. The Rat King! So do you see how that's like uh, circling around the boss like that? I need to fix that. Also, the boss has like 10,000 health or I guess 8,000 health and I melted him. <laughs> so there's something wrong here. DPS 147, DPS 84. Poison though, I think poison is doing, well, bleed. I was applying a lot of bleed, so that's something which was increasing the amount of damage that enemies take. Plus, I was stacking poison on the boss like crazy. And he was just getting chunked. So I definitely think I need to... I need to reduce the prevalence of some of these affixes. Like, the fact that I got to the first boss and I have five affixes on my gun is, like, ridiculous. It's fun, don't get me wrong, but it's just... I think it's a little bit too fast in the scaling here. Let's see, Mouse Potato. Mouse Potato Literature Club. That's a very intriguing name. <laughs> I love it. Uh, maybe determine number of affixes picked up first and then run a script that fixed number of times. So I'm not entirely sure what you mean. So determine the number of affixes first and then run a script that fixed number of times. Oh, I see. Run a script for the number of times that was picked. Um, yeah, I could do that. The thing is, like, I, I think it would have to be like a normal distribution because you want one affix, the likelihood of picking one affix to be reasonably good, but then the likelihood of picking two affixes, it shouldn't be linear, right? It should be like a drop off. So it's like, if you have a 50% chance of choosing one affix, then it shouldn't be 
another 50% chance to pick a second one, it should be like a 25% chance to pick a second one. So like the chances go down as you increase. Are you planning on ever, uh, wait, so let's see. You have a couple more messages here. Some obstacles would be nice. Yes, I have, there's another arena, the graveyard after this one, which has some terrain features. So it's not a perfect square. Um, I figured the first level should just be a square so it's easy to navigate, but then the next levels are going to have areas that you can't walk through. Maybe even interactable stuff. Yeah, interactable would be cool. Am I planning on making an enemy that can turn invisible? I wasn't, no, but uh, that's, that's a good idea. This passive screen is off-center. I'm just going to fix this really quick. Okay. So actually, I can grab an upgrade here and show you what the graveyard looks like. It's a little bit buggy, though. Let's see. I'm just going to take gold. So it's a little bit buggy, but here's the graveyard. So the graveyard is, it has these four squares here, which you can't pass through. So it's more of like a cross shape. And it crashed. So there's a known crash with Godot 4 and C sharp, which is being fixed hopefully soon. So. I just have to live with that crash for now. Let's see if we can figure out this affix picking stuff. Okay, so let's do this. Var loot table is equal to We'll copy this. Okay. Why is this erroring? Oh, number. I see. So I think I actually want... Um... Wait a minute. Is this wrong? Maybe this is just wrong here. So it's saying, which loot table should I use? If my number, oh, minimum affixes is not something that I'm using. Okay, never mind then. Okay, so I can't pull the loot table out of the out of the loop here. Basically, for testing purposes, I can pass in as parameters the minimum number of affixes that I need and uh, just for testing. So I think there's, um, yeah, this test gun generation here, which is using the old UI, but let's see. So I can see it's running automatically, but this is generating random guns. So I can kind of get an idea of what happens when guns are generated. That also spits out an absurd number of <laughs> of uh, errors, but we're going to ignore that. So um, I guess we'll just have to. Hmm. Oh, I see. Okay, you're using your niche account to uh, to comment. That already looks more interesting. Good. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you like that. Um, I have an idea based on the imaginary friend pass of the Phantom Monarch or the Phantom Thief if you're feeling spicy. Basically, a boss that uses all your guns and passives, or just guns. Ooh. Yeah, that's cool. That's a cool idea. I like that. I like that a lot. 
Uh, okay, so how are we gonna actually do this? Well, I guess I might take, let's see. I might take your advice, Mouse, because the problem is the way that I was controlling the likelihood of things being picked is by having this null in the affix loot table. So there's just a chance to pick nothing from the loot table. But I think you're probably right that I should control the chance of picking something outside of the loot table. So I have more control over, over it. So I should probably just, let's just get rid of that affix loot table. Like so. Let's rename this to affix loot table. So this will just be all non-null entries for all the affixes that are available in the game, which is kind of a small list right now. And then when I go to pick affixes here, um, we're going to get rid of this affix loot table dot pick item. OK, so let's do this then var number two pick is equal to Matthew till dot rng dot rand fn so we're going to use a normal distribution and uh so the mean is uh let's see one is the mean and the deviation do we want to do something like 0.25 I don't know if that's going to produce the results that we want, but uh, dot. Do I want to round or do I want to fl uh, floor? Let's see. Math F dot floor to int. And we want to take the absolute value of this as well because it can go to the negative. So math util or not, not math util math F dot abs this. OK. So we're essentially getting an integer that is a normally distributed integer with a mean of one and a standard deviation of 0.25. Now the floor to int, yes, that's gonna work properly. So it has to generate two or above. And yeah, so that's the number to pick. And then um, if parameters dot minimum affixes, is greater than zero, then we're gonna say number to pick is equal to parameters dot minimum affixes. Well, we wanted to do math f dot minimum, or no, the, the maximum of the minimum affixes or the number to pick. Okay, so basically what we're saying is you have to pick at least that so actually I can I can move that up because if the minimum affix is zero, then it doesn't matter. Okay, and then we're going to for far i equals zero, i is less than number to pick, i plus plus. We're going to bring this up. And we can get rid of that. Oops. Wait, what did I do? All right. This is already seeming much cleaner to me. Okay. I wish I could run this a bunch of times. I guess I can. For int or for i equal uh for i equals zero i is less than ten thousand i plus plus so i'm just writing a, a quick bit of code here just to test it pick affixes
Do I even need anything in these randomizer parameters? Pick affixes. Oh, interesting. This uh, has a side effect, which is that it also adds the existing affixes of the gun. So we'll just put this in a block. That probably shouldn't be in this method. But we'll just leave it in, but we'll allow gun part resource to be nothing. Yeah, that's not good. Where is this even used? Find usages. Randomize resource. Oh, interesting. Um, I'm going to create a new method. It kind of seems like overkill, but private static list gun part affix. Well, I guess if it's, I guess if it's private, yeah, it's fine. I'm not going to overthink this. Okay, let's see. What are you doing? I am balancing the game, working on a vertical slice, trying to get it, the game into a place where you all can play it feel like you should ceiling it so it's never zero. No, it should be zero sometimes. Sometimes you'll get a part that doesn't have any affixes. And what I wrote up here, I'm trying to just figure, I'm gonna average it out. So I have the affixes here. And I'm gonna say affix sum plus equals affixes dot count. And then I'm going to do this gd dot print, print s, average gun part affix count um affix sum divided by 10,000 then I'm also going to print another one so var max affix count max affix count is equal to math f dot max of max affix count and affixes dot count <laughs> lots of uh, the same word over and over again max affix count all right let's run the game and see what happens It did not do anything. Uh, what happens if I run it from here? Here we go. Average gun part affix count. So it's on average picking 0.5 and the max was one. Interesting. So that's not what I want. So let's change this uh, standard deviation to 0.5 instead. Max affix count was two out of 10,000. Okay, so we're getting there. The average affix count was 0.5. Let's turn this up to one as the standard deviation then. There we go. So now the average is 0.7 with the max being four. How often do I stream? Uh, uh, not super often. Um, every other weekend or so is is kind of my cadence right now. I just don't have uh, I don't have like regular time to uh, 
to do it consistently. I usually announce it on Twitter, so if you want to follow me on Twitter at Firebelly, um, you'll get a notification there. You can also uh, hit the notification bell on YouTube, and you'll get a notification on your phone whenever I'm going live. It's usually... Usually, if I'm streaming, it will be Sunday or Saturday morning, Eastern time. Alright, so I think that's a pretty reasonable, so... I don't know how many times four got picked. Let's uh, let's make this a little bit more. Uh, if I knew math, if I knew how to calculate normal distributions, I'd be able to do this math myself. But we'll have the computer calculate it for me. <laughs> All right, so let's create a dictionary. Var uh, da, da, da. affix dictionary is equal to new dictionary. And it's going to be an int and an int. Okay. Affix if affix dict dot has contains key affixes dot count. So this needs to be if not. Then we're going to say affix dict affixes dot count is equal to zero. And then affix dict affixes dot count. And we're just going to increment it. What is this trying to tell me to do? Oh, try add. There's a try add, really? Dang. Okay. So now can I print this dictionary? Oh, maybe I should use a Godot dictionary, huh? Using Godot collections dictionary. Try add is not a thing here, so. The reason I'm gonna use a Godot dictionary is because it can be printed um, nicer. Godot has support for printing dictionaries. Ambiguous, what does this mean? Ambiguous invocation, double max, float what? Oh, the Godot dictionary doesn't recognize count as being an... Huh? <laughs> Why doesn't it know what the type of count is? That's weird. Okay, well. Okay. Let's see if that works. All right, Dula, good to see you. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Oh, you're not saying that. Fun banana is saying that. Okay, yeah, I can't read Russian. Never mind. Thank you for translating that. <laughs> I didn't know I was already following you on Twitter. Well, yeah, I don't. I don't post on my Twitter very often. I should. Uh. All right, let's see if this works now. Oh, I didn't even print the dictionary. I went through all that effort and I didn't print it. So now I'm gonna be able to see the actual numerical distribution of those affix counts here. All right, so zero affixes occurs 4,600 times out of 10,000. One affix occurs Three, uh, th 3,700, 3,800 times. Two occurs a thousand times out of uh, 10,000. Three 
216 and 419. That sounds like a good distribution to me. So one in a thousand times your gun part will generate with four affixes. And then 216 times out of 10,000 is it'll generate with three affixes. But the more common is like roughly 13% of the time it'll generate with two. 37% of the time it will generate with one, and 46% of the time it will have nothing. That seems reasonable, but seeming reasonable is not a good metric. We need to play it and see how it feels. I'm going to put this, uh, I'm going to keep that method around. Private void, calculate, affix distribution I'm just going to throw that in there cool and we're going to get rid of this max affixes so instead of putting a hard limit on the affixes we're just going to let the, um, the normal distribution handle that for us so it's kind of like a soft cap like the, the chances of you getting to 5 is basically impossible all right well let's see let's see how that plays i'm curious now just doing some more play testing hopefully this is a little bit more entertaining watching me play than uh watching me fiddle with ui and whatnot but uh while we're play testing this um, thank you all for being here with me. It's really fun. And for all the people watching the VOD, welcome to you as well. If you're interested in this game, you can wishlist it. The link is in the description. And also you could take my Udemy course, which is also in the description, to learn how to build a game in Godot 4. All right, advertisements out of the way. We've got the scramble gun here. Let's, uh, let's scramble the shotgun. All right, what do we get? So the gun scrambler just completely randomizes all of your parts. Okay. So what did I get? Oil, oil stack, poison stack, and first bullet deals extra damage. Nice. All right, let's upgrade. I haven't seen it. Wait a minute. Did I not add, do I have a fire affix? Oh, I have a fire affix, but I never added it. Oh, wow. I should probably make this automatically pull from, let's see. Let me just count these up. Hold on a second. So I've got one, so I've got eight lines here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. Yeah, nine lines. I've got, does it tell me somewhere how many files I have selected if I do this? No. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yep, so I'm missing the fire affix. I can't believe I haven't added that into the pool. Goodness. I have an affix that applies a burning status and I never added it into the table. All right, let's restart. Hello, Nick. Welcome, welcome. I'm a big fan since taking the course. You're a big inspiration to me and it's great to see you actually working on stuff and putting the stuff you taught to use. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you for taking the course and I'm glad that you got a lot of value out of that. And I'm also glad that, that this stream is entertaining. Yeah, it's um, streaming's a lot of fun. I need to figure out how I can do it more regularly. Uh, let's do quickness. <clears throat> Does fire deal more damage to enemies with oil stacks? Not by default, but um, you can get 
a passive called combustion, which creates a small explosion every time fire and oil mix together. One poison stack. Let's see. What's up? With, why does it keep picking poison? Did I do something wrong? Uh, okay. So I think it doesn't really matter. I guess I'll put it on. I'm going to take the gold, actually. I'm going to take the gold. I also need to figure out the tricky thing about working with this small resolution is that I want to put a status indicator above enemies that have certain status effects, but the game is already so hectic and cluttered already that I just don't want to add more visual noise. So I think just adding like a particle effect is probably good, but you also can't tell how many stacks are on an enemy. But they also, the, the problem that I have, I think this is a design problem that I need to figure out, is that, um, you know, the number of stacks that you apply doesn't really matter because you kill enemies so fast anyway. So it's like poison can stack up to 10 times, but it's like if you kill an enemy all the time when it only has three stacks, then the only place where stacking things is useful is on the boss. And the problem with that is that I can balance the game around the typical gameplay, which is like applying stacks to regular enemies. But then, you know, if the average number of stacks that an enemy has when they die is three and I balance it around that, and then all of a sudden you can put 10 stacks on the boss, well, now the boss is going to die much faster. So I think I might have to change the stack mechanic. I think I kind of... Stacking is kind of useless. I might just make it a flat status effect that just applies its status and can stack one time and can be refreshed by, by, by applying it again, but... I don't really see I don't really see the point of introducing that extra stack complexity and all that balancing given that enemies are going to be dying so quickly anyway. I don't know. Any thoughts on that? So I just used the well. It gave me a uh, passive for 10 gold, the imaginary friend. Look at that. My wish has been fulfilled. Maybe I should make the well multi-use, huh? Just as long as you have the money, you can keep doing it. Because you can only use it once right now. Hmm. Here we go. Cause an explosion when oil is applied to burning enemies. Okay, let's take that. Here we go. Bullets pierce through enemies. We got the banana receiver. Let's go. Does fire... Oh, let's see, I already read that. Hello, Pip... Pipak? Welcome, welcome. Glad to see you here. Welcome to the stream. We're having a good time. What if you kept the stack code in, but not implemented in any of the existing effects, but make the effects where stacking is wanted? Yes, I can definitely do that. The thing is, like, the um, the stacking code is not really shared. <laughs> it's it's something that probably should be generic, but I basically just copy-pasted it. So there's nothing really to preserve, you know what I mean? Hello, Lucam. Let's see. Maybe limit the stacks of poison to five, but make it contagious to nearby enemies when they die. That's an interesting idea. So the fire works that way, actually. So when you kill an enemy that's on fire, it leaves behind a fire area that also applies fire. I wish I could get a fire affix so I could show you. Increase health by one permanently. Ooh, I kind of feel like I should take that. Is that wrong there? Yeah, there's a problem with my N right there. Let me fix that while I'm while I'm noticing it. Where's the N? Where's the N? Here it is. Just needed to delete that one little pixel right there. Okay. 
back to the game. Let's take the health. All right, what do we got here? Bullets track to the nearest. Um, let's reforge. Reforge again. Uh, yes, let's take that one. I think I might need to tweak the the, the affix generation just a little bit because I'm not seeing very many parts that have um, two affixes on them. You could also maybe uh, keep the stacks around, but do a steeper stack fall off time. Weak enemies die quickly, so it wouldn't matter much. But for the bosses, you could keep the numbers from getting too big. That's a good idea. Yeah. So you still have some benefit from being able to apply poison very fast, for instance, to the boss, but without it like having too much runaway damage. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Oh, I'm dying really bad. <laughs> no. Stop. E okay, I picked up health. Cool. I'm trying to make, uh, I want to make it possible to build around taking damage intentionally too. So I have, I have some ideas in the backlog of how I can make regenerating health more accessible. Fifty-eight gold. Let's see. Do I have? Ooh. Zap passive. Nice. Okay. Create an explosion when the magazine becomes empty. Yes. That one is amazing. Check this out. Well, let me do this first. Bullet splits when colliding with enemy. I'll uh, reforge. Yeah, that I need to tweak. Oh, here we go. Poison stack. Lots of poison. I'll take that. I'm going to tweak the, uh, the generation just a little bit. The Rat King. Oh, I'm doing much less damage to him this time. Oof. Ah, crash. No. <sighs> Feels bad. I have 406 errors, though. What the heck? I don't know what any of these errors are. Is this my... Oh, wait. Yeah, I don't know what this is. Well, I hope that's not causing too many problems. All right, let's tweak these numbers a little bit more. So let's see. Here we go. So let's maybe make it 1.25 as the, uh, the the distribution here. And then let's put um, calculate affix distribution here and let's run it and see what happens. We just bump up the number ever so slightly. All right, what do we got here? It did not... Disposable, not registered. Whatever does that mean? Is that a banana? It is a banana. <clears throat> Maybe apply poison cloud, make it only apply with a passive. Yeah, that could work. Yeah, yeah. If I recall, that's kind of how Risk of Rain 2 does it. Oh, I see with the fast fall off. Something is going very wrong here. I'll have to investigate that later. Why is this not working though? Calculate affix distribution is not printing anything. Here it goes. Why is that not working? Okay. So the average is now 0.8. 
the max ended up being five. Eight out of 10,000 was five affixes. Whoo. 78 out of 10,000 was four. Um, let's see. One ended up. What is that? Why does that not seem right to me? So 16% of the time it'll generate two. You know what, maybe I will, uh, I guess I could, what I could do is I could, um, instead of keeping the mean at one, I could make the mean at 1.5 and then turn down this distribution, right? See if that works. Okay, so now the average is one, but 30% of the time it generates nothing. 38% um, of the time it generates one, 25% of the time it generates two, and then we have very small, two out of 10,000 chance to generate five. <laughs> That's fine, I can leave that in there. Um, 52 out of 10,000 chance to generate four, 641 out of 10,000, so, 6.4% chance to generate three. That sounds reasonable. Yeah, I think the big thing is there's now a 25% chance to have two affixes generated. Okay, let's let's give that a shot. Let's see how that feels. You know how most games make it a vampire modifier? Um, to random heal you upon killing an enemy. Maybe you can make the meter fill up when killing enemies and heal the player when the meter is filled. That's a cool idea, yeah. Yeah, some kind of uh, kill to heal mechanic. Um, it could be tied in with like the blood status effect too, like kill X number of enemies that are bleeding. You know. Tiny chance of five is kind of fun. Chance of building a god run. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking too. Is like, just let it stay there because when when somebody hits that two out of 10,000 chance, they're going to be like, whoa, you know? And they're just going to have like a paragraph of affixes on their gun. Um, all right, so let's see. Create an explosion when the magazine becomes empty. Here we go. So this one generated three. I'm going to have to take that. All right, let's try it. Maybe I'll turn down the mean just a little bit. Instead of 1.5, I'll make it 1.25 or something. Look at this, bullets are tracking. I can aim this way and they curve around. The tracking is a little bit too, I don't want it to be like homing missiles. I just want it to be like a gradual turn toward enemies. Okay, this is feeling really good. Just the, the minor tweaks that we've done so far. Stamina, reload both guns on glass. Uh, let's do clear nearby bullets on dash. That sounds good to me. And I also need to re-import this resource. And now that I'm thinking about it, I actually need to fix the padded red as well. Sorry, trying not to go on too many tangents here, but. Okay, back to the game. What do we got here? Oh, dang. Actually, I don't think that's gonna be useful on that one. Uh, let's put on the uh, banana receiver here. Banana receiver. <laughs> I love the banana gun. I think it's one of my favorites. The banana gun and the worm gun. I need to adjust the uh, knockback too because I can essentially freeze enemies in place with the knockback that's in the game. And I want to not have that be a thing.
Maybe I'll fix that on this stream, I don't know. I have an idea for how I might fix the knockback, but... More important things to do. Alright, I'm gonna write that down, though. Okay. Oh, we got the shop. All right. Um, let's see what he's got. So he's got health. Oh, dang. Look at that. Bullet tracking. Apply stack of bleed. Fire rate increases. What is the fire rate? 5.2. Fire stack. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm buying it. Or do I want to put it on this one? No, let's stack this gun up for sure. Stack that one up. We've got 17 gold left. Uh, I guess the problem with this one is that... Hmm. I'm gonna have to adjust this because I can't see what the stat is because I don't have enough money. So I can't make a judgment as to whether I need to go get more money or not. Okay, let me write that down too. Just taking notes, piles of tasks to do later. Let's, um, I'm gonna actually take some gold here. Inflict maximum blood stats. Let's do health increase, there we go. And then, yeah, let's take the money. I've got my money back to the shop. Here we go. So capacity goes up, range goes up. Um, do I want to do that? Oh, here's another fire stack. But a bunch of stats go down here. Wait, here we go. So I've got a fire stack on my left gun and this one has oil. So if I buy this one, now I've got fire and oil, and now I can go and look for that um, passive that makes it explode. Here we go. All right, so you see how the fire gets left behind when they die? So that's kind of a... I might make that more of like a fire burning area instead of an explosion. Dang, this gun is killing things, like, instantly. <laughs> I don't know how this got so, uh, so damaging. That's okay, it's, it's fine to be OP for a couple of waves because the enemies scale up pretty quickly. So I'm actually not too worried about the player having a really, really, really powerful build for a couple of waves. Because eventually, the goal of this game is to force you to have to upgrade. So, like, you're not going to be able to get a perfect setup on wave three and then have that carry you for the rest of the game. Like, there's going to be a point where you're just not doing enough damage anymore. And so then you're going to have to make sacrifices to increase your damage. So the idea is that you're not going to be able to have a build that you can just carry to the end game. Um, except for, obviously, your passives. The passives that you select stick with you. And so you kind of have to, like, build up enough general passives such that you can focus your build in a bunch of different ways, if that makes sense. I think the knockback is fine because while overwhelming one enemy... Yeah, I like the knockback. It's not going away. It's just um, the enemies get stuck in place if they're being knocked back frequently, so they stop moving. I actually want them to keep going backwards, so there's something wrong with my code there that's not working. Maybe they make it uh, weaker if there's only one enemy in the room. Uh, perhaps, yes. PSP, um, what is the task manager app you're using? It's Obsidian MD, 
with uh, um, the community or the Kanban. The plugin is called Obsidian Kanban. It's a community plugin for Obsidian. What about a modifier that makes it so you have a small chance to shoot a random bullet? I like where your mind is at with that one. The thing that I'm not certain about is the bullets themselves don't really have stats. Um, it's the guns that confer the stats to the bullets. So the bullets are just a stat delivery mechanism, essentially. And so just shooting a different bullet is, um, is not quite there, but I could imagine something like um, you shoot a gun, you shoot a bullet from your other gun, right? So you have a chance to shoot a bullet from your other gun while you're shooting one gun. That could be interesting, right? So like it takes the stats of the gun that you have on your back currently. So like I have the oil gun on my back here. You take the stats of the gun that's on your back and just like throw it in with, you know, shooting this one, right? So that's a cool idea. All right, let's take a look at these upgrades here. Phantom gun. Yes, let's do it. Phantom gun. All right, what are we losing here? Add two fire stacks. And adding bleed. And how much increases the capacity and decreases the range. That's okay. Let's take it. Excellent. All right, let's go. The Rat King. I'm hopefully I don't crash again. That would be not good. Ah, there we go. Um, okay. Change fire status to fire to burning ground rather than explosion. I don't think that this needs to be made for the demo, so I'm just going to throw this in the backlog. Anything that's in this to-do is basically stuff that I need to have done for the demo. So I have to be judicious about what I'm what I'm changing. All right, what changes have I made here? Mm, I have a rotisserie, or not a rotisserie. I have a full chicken in my slow cooker right now, and it is smelling so good. Let me tell you what. Okay, let me commit what I've got here. Yes, that's good. I'm just double checking everything here. Oh, I don't want, yeah, good thing I double checked because I don't want this here. There we go. Okay, um, tweak, affix, pick chance. Okay. Could have a chance for the gun to fire a second bullet of the same type at a random enemy. That's a cool idea as well. All right, let's uh, let's fight the the rat king again. Just see what's up. A firework gun that shoots low damage bullets that explode in colorful shrapnel. That's cool. Yeah, firework gun. I love that. I'm going to add that to obsidian here in a second. Firework gun would be so fun. All right. Rat King is feeling pretty good. All right, let's add this. 
gun affix ideas ideation do I have a list of guns here gun ideas here we go firework gun And then gun affix ideas, let's do shoot bullet from other gun. Let's call it a chance to shoot bullet from other gun at, uh, let's just say nearest enemy. These are all just rough. Um, these are all just rough wording. Um, it's not really going to, um, this is not final, I guess is what I'm trying to say. This cool one, this player passive that I thought of for intentionally taking damage is, so the idea is that when you take damage, um, from an enemy, a health goblin will spawn and it will run around the room and maybe it has a lifetime of like 10 seconds or something. And the idea is that if you manage to kill the health goblin before it escapes, then um, you get your health back. So it's a little bit of an interactive way of reclaiming health. And this is gonna be particularly useful if you're building a build around intentionally losing health. So I think that's pretty neat. Cool. All right. Well, we're coming up on three hours for the stream, so I think I'm going to call it there. I'm going to go eat some lunch um, and take a break. So thank you all for for watching and collaborating with me. It was really fun. I really appreciate that. Again, if you're interested in the game Gunforged, uh, you can wishlist it on Steam below. So I'd greatly appreciate it if you would do that. And if you're interested to learn how to build a game in Godot 4, then you can uh, check out my Udemy course. A link to that is also in the description. And also, you can sign up for my newsletter at firebelly.com to stay up to date with my big announcements and all that stuff. So, yeah, you can do all that if you're interested. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and hanging out with me. And let's see, we've got one final message here. I have an idea, idea champion enemies that drop extra gold when killed, but have bonus stats as shown by a crown above their head. Yes, like the Path of Exile style rare enemies um, that are just a little bit more powerful, but drop extra rewards. I definitely want to do that. So we're on the same page about that as well. Thank you so much to Cam. I really appreciate that. All right. Yeah. Have a good week to you as well. Everyone watching. And uh, I will see you in the next video or the next stream, whichever one comes first. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>